uh, I'll be covering the different aspects and so on there. But, uh, but like epidemiology has already been covered by Ross, so I will just touch on it only. Uh, if you look at the bottom bit here, the Rochester experience, over the period of 20 years, four, over 4,000 kidney transplants were performed, and of those, 11% did have polycystic disease, and a quarter of them underwent nephrectomy at some stage either before or after having the transplant. So that's a very important message. They do present the polycystic disease presents with various extra renal manifestations as shown there, which Ross has already covered, like such in the liver, pancreas, seminal vesicles, and they're covering the membrane of the brain. And there can be aneurysms involving this, this intracranial arteries, the thoracic artery, and the coronaries. There could be mitral valve prolapse or mitral registration. The large bowel can have outpouching, the condition called diverticulosis, which can get inflamed. And in one of the studies where I was in South Wales, uh, uh, the, the high incidence of abdominal wall hernias, such as incisional inguinal and paraumbilical hernias, were demonstrated in patients who had polycystic kidney disease in comparison to the other renal failure patients. That means 45. <coughs> Uh, 45% versus 8%. So when, when, when do I get involved uh, in the management of polycystic kidney disease? Initially, the patients are managed medically. Later on, with progressive deterioration of renal function, when the GFR falls around 15 or below, or sometimes even 20, patients are referred for creation of dialysis access or for transplant assessment. And many of these patients, before or after transplants, do have these symptoms, pain, bleeding, infections, uh, infection due to stones, and mechanical symptoms. Okay, thank you. Mechanical symptoms such as, uh, okay. Uh, But I, I can't get the light then, pointer. I don't, why don't I do it for you? Why don't okay. you, tell, you tell me. Oh, you need the pointer. Pointer, Ms. Okay, Sorry. that's all right. Thank you. So, <laughs> so like compression of the stomach, bowel can lead to symptoms. So early satiety, sometimes bowel obstruction. And the large volume of kidney can pressure the diaphragm, leading to difficulty in breathing. So when those symptoms uh, uh, appear, then obviously surgical intervention is needed. Sorry about that. Oh, I've flipped too much. Right, so, so let's talk about transplantation in, uh, in polycystic kidney disease. Obviously, when the, the, the end stage renal disease end is, is reached, that means when life cannot be sustained without some form of renal replacement therapy, transplantation is the best option. Why? Because it improves quality of life, improve survival, and is cost effective. So looking at the improved quality of life, there are several examples. Say for example, oh, sorry about that. Uh, I'll have to be careful. Okay, uh, and there, uh, the, the, the slide shows improved nutrition. That means the dietary restrictions, restriction of fluid intake, those are lifted after transplant, so you can have a better nutrition. There's improved sexual function and fertility after transplant. So, this lady has had a baby. The improved physical activity. These are all transplant patients, liver, lungs, kidney, pancreas. They have taken part actively in the British transplant games and their performance has been as good as any, any one of us. Uh, all of us know about Lucy Claire Davis from the film Office. She has had kidney failure and her mother, Hazel, gave her a kidney in 1997 and she's having a normal quality of life. Amy Purdy, the actress from Hollywood, she suffered from meningococcal meningitis, uh, uh, and that led to acute kidney injury and kidney failure. She had deep vein thrombosis on both legs, so she had to have amputation, balloony amputation on both legs. And two years later, her father gave her a kidney, and then she had basically a very good quality of life. 
She partook in Paralympic Games and had won several medals. And now she is a very prolific motivational speaker. And last but not the least, gentlemen, Mr. Oli. He was former prime minister in Nepal, where I come from. He had had two living donor transplants, the second being three years ago. And he took six weeks time off when he was in power to have the transplant and return back to work like a, anybody else. And he was one of the best prime ministers of the country ever had. Now, in six days time, there's national election taking place. Unfortunately, I can't vote, I'm a British citizen. <laughs> so, so he is standing as a member of parliament from the same constituency where I was born and I originally came from. So it's very interesting. Look at the quality of life improvement following kidney transplantation. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> He's a politician. <laughs> yeah, he, he was a backbencher, but now he's leading us. <laughs> uh, this, this, is, um, this slide shows the improved quality of life after the transplantation. Uh, my daughter Alice basically did a, 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 a questionnaire survey in our institution about 12 years ago and has shown that in all domains, the physical and mental uh, uh, the quality of life domains, there have been significant improvement in the score after transplantation. And some of them are even better than the controls. Dialysis and transplantation, when you compare the survival, there's definitely a difference in patient survival between the two. What about the cost? Transplant is very cost effective. The average cost of dialysis patients per year is about 31,000 pounds. Hemodialysis costs about 35,000, and peritoneal dialysis costs about half of that. The first year is slightly expensive for transplant because that, the surgical cost of surgery, the various medications, hospitalization, that costs about 20,000 pounds. And subsequent maintenance cost for immunosuppressive drugs is about 5,000 pounds. So there's net saving. First year, about 5,800 pounds, and subsequent years, quite a lot of money is saved. And 3% of the NHS budget is spent on kidney failure patients. So it's quite significant. So when is the best time to transplant? The traditional practice until about 20 years used to be uh, when patients had CKD5, GFR around 15, they used to be referred to surgeon for dialysis excess surgery. They used to be put on dialysis. And then, then used to be referred for transplant assessment. And either they go on a transplant waiting list, national DC donor waiting list, if they didn't have a living donor, or if there was a living donor, they, they used to have living donor transplant. But the practice has changed, or if the patient wasn't suitable for transplant, is to have long-term dialysis. But the current practice is, and which is the ideal practice, as soon as the GFR falls around, becomes around 20, between 15 and 20, the patients are referred for transplant evaluation. We do a transplant assessment, jointly with physician, and then, then, oops, it's a bit crazy, sorry. Right, so they are put on the waiting list. As soon as the GFR is below 15, they are either put on the list in, uh, waiting list or have a living donor transplant if available. And then, while on the waiting list, they have dialysis excess surgery and go on dialysis if they didn't have a transplant, or so that's how it works out currently. So the transplantation before having dialysis is known as preemptive transplant, has got several advantages, such as you don't need to have dialysis excess surgery. The complications of dialysis are avoided, the cardiovascular complications particularly. And live donor transplant can, can be done in a planned way that takes, it takes about two to six months to work up a donor and to have a transplant. So that's a great advantage. Less delayed graft function. Delayed graft function means a sleepy kidney. Uh, if we do a disease on a transplant, about 20% of the DVD and about 50% of the DCD transplant will come to that point. Don't work initially. They go to, the kidney goes to sleep for about a week, 10 days. And presence of DGF has got long-term impact on long-term graft function. So in living donor transplant, obviously over 95% of them work straight away. So this situation doesn't arise. There are better graft survival, based on better patient survival, there's better quality of life, and then higher return to work rates, and it's cost saving. So preemptive transplant is the way forward. The patient survival 
is definitely better, depending on the duration of dialysis. If you look at the one-year graph survival, the patients who are on dialysis for greater than three years do have inferior quality graph survival compared to those who have preemptive transplant. It's a very important message. So renal transplant assessment. Obviously, not everyone with kidney failure are suitable for kidney transplantation. Nearly half of them don't, can't have transplant. So when they come for assessment to us, we try to find out who are those candidates who do not benefit from transplant or who, who, who in whom the transplant can prove deleterious, can, can be harmful. So, so these are the different contraindications for transplant. These are the people who should not have transplant. Patients with disseminated cancer, respiratory, refractory heart failure, respiratory failure, advanced liver disease, that means alcoholic liver cirrhosis, extensive vascular disease involving heart, brain, and peripheral limb arteries, chronic infections unresponsive to treatment, HIV infection, several mental retardation, psychosocial problems, and the people who can't, who don't uh, adhere to their drugs and medications or dialysis, they are real problematic. Even if they have transplant, they will not take their medication regularly and the organs will get rejected. It, this happens particularly with teenagers. So the compliance is very, very important in the consideration for assessing suitability for transplant. So transplant is a major operation, takes three to four hours under general anesthesia, sometimes even longer. So the patient should be able to stand the stress of surgery and should recover well. So that's important. And also in relation to polycystic kidney, uh, we basically look for the different symptoms. For example, if a patient has got severe abdominal pain, which is maybe due to bleeding or recurrent infections, it's best to remove the kidney before transplant because the infection is no good news after transplant. The patients are immunosuppressed, they're on heavy duty immunosuppression and the infection under that in this situation can prove fatal. There can be septicemia so, uh, uh, and the kidney may not work. The other, other symptoms, if they are present, they all have to be taken into consideration before transplant. The important point is to make a decision whether the patient is nephrectomy before transplant or not. And also, so when you do assessment, you look at the size of the kidney, whether, this kid, whether the kidney extends well down to the pelvis. If that's the case, then there is no room for placing the kidney. In, in that situation, we have to create space and nephrectomy is indicated. The other important point is over the age of 50, everyone has uh, echocardiogram and uh, a MIV scan as a routine to make sure that there is no underlying coronary artery disease because we have lost few patients who had pre-existing heart problems and underwent surgery. So cardiac workup is very thorough. A CT and MRI basically done to assess the size of the kidney if indicated. Intracranial aneurysms, I will come to that point now. So basically, we don't do routine MRI in, for renal transplant assessment, but with the presence of family history, or if there are any symptoms, headache, cranial nerve palsy, all those features of intracranial aneurysm, in that situation, uh, we ask for MR angiogram. And if there's an aneurysm, neurologists are consulted, and they deal with aneurysm before doing surgery. Otherwise, sometimes undiagnosed cerebral aneurysm can lead to catastrophic perioperative bleeding. So if the, if the recipient is considered suitable for transplant, obviously we have mentioned about the advantage of uh, uh, transplantation. It's best to have a living donor transplant rather than digital donor transplant, but that's not always possible. So there are different types of kidney donors. The living donors could be living related, such as siblings, parents, living unrelated to spouse or friends, or there is a national living donor kidney sharing scheme where we exchange the kidneys when the blood groups are incompatible, or if there is sensitization from previous transplant or blood transfusion, if there's antibodies present already in the blood, then the transplant has become very risky because there can be severe rejection immediately after transplant. So in those situations, we registered the donor and recipient in the national living donor kidney sharing scheme and exchange is done. Exchange between the compatible kidneys are done. There are also many non-directed altruistic donors at the moment. There are volunteers who wish to donate their kidney to help others and, and they can donate anyone else on the waiting list. The deceased donor, there are two categories. One is called donation after brain death and donation after circulatory death. So the difference between those two are the brain dead donors are the patients who have had a stroke 
or head injuries and our intensive care unit on ventilator who do not have their, who do not make their own effort to breathe because of the damage to the breathing centers on the brain. Whereas in the DCD donors, these are also patients in the intensive care unit admitted for various reasons. After having surgery, after having septic shocks, that sort of situation. But the brain stem reflexes are present. They still breathe. They are on ventilator, but if you stop the ventilator, they keep breathing. So that kind of donors where further treatment is considered to be futile, they become donor. In that situation, with the consent from the family, the treatment is withdrawn and we wait for a couple of hours. If the heart stops, then organ retrieval takes place. Whereas in DVD donor, as soon as the ventilator is stopped, the heart stops and breathing stops. So in UK, and that's as of 31st of March this year, there had been over 8,000 patients on the waiting list. Uh, however, about over 3,400 patients were suspended from the waiting list because of various reasons. They were waiting, they were, they were on the list for several months or years, and their health condition deteriorated, so they were considered unsuitable to have a transplant. That's why they were suspended. So as you can see, due to lack of organ donors, many people stay on the transplant waiting list get suspended, some of them get removed from the waiting list, others may die. So, uh, so if you look at here, uh, in 2021, 2022, 268 patients died from lack of organ. And there are other organ, similarly, uh, patients have been waiting for other organs as well. And last year, so, Total number, 3,011 patients underwent kidney transplantation of their 29% uh, from living donor source, 39% from DVD source, and 11 from DCD donors. So about a third of the kidney transplant performed in UK are from living donor source. So living donor transplantation has definite advantages. There are several advantages, such as it's a planned procedure. So you can have routine transplant or positive cross match or even compatible transplant. The cold ischemia time is very important because it's the time from removal of the kidney to transplantation. In DC donor transplantation, that's usually about 16 hours, 18 hours, sometimes even 24 hours. So that has got negative impact on the kidney functions in short term as well as long term. So in living donor transplant, the cold ischemia time is about two hours. Uh, last week I had one, it was about an hour. So we did parallel two cases. The low rejection rate is because of the immediate function and also because of the low rejection rate following living donor transplant, you don't need a very intensive immunosuppressive regimen. The immunosuppressive drugs can be reduced very rapidly. The waiting time is reduced, there's preemptive transplant is possible, better graft and patient survival, and it's emotional benefit of the donor, and it's a better choice during the COVID pandemic because after having living donor transplant, patient can come into the hospital and get out in four to five days time. Whereas in tissue donor transplant, as I said, 50% of the kidneys sometimes don't work immediately. They stay in the hospital for 10, 14 days. We have to biopsy them, treat with other drugs. So, so that is preferable. And as I said, one third of the total transplant done in UK are from living donor source. This slide basically shows uh, the, the patient survival related to the age of the recipient the type of donor, and the duration of dialysis is two years in this case. But if you have longer duration, say four years of dialysis, the survival will be reduced. And the youngest age between 18 and 39 obviously benefit most. The projected uh, uh, graph survival is 40 years for living donor transplant when the age is of that range. But if you consider this age, 65 years, over 65 years of age, the, the survival benefit is not that great as you see here. However, the quality of life is significantly improved. So this is very important to realize that after the age of 65, it's the, for the sake of quality of life with the transplant, not to gain the, 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 the period. Uh, there's obviously a difference between uh, uh, patient survival between a living and deceased donor, and the difference is about 16% over the period of 10 years time. So living donor transplant, obviously, we need a donor, and the donor has to be assessed very thoroughly. We have got a living donor coordination team in Sheffield. Anybody who wants to come forward, they first contact the living 
a, a donation team, the coordination team, and then they send information back. They start the, they initiate their workup process. That takes a few weeks, three to six weeks at least. And the assessment is very thorough. I've been involved in the Living Donor Program since I've been in Safil, at least 20 years now. And you can say that you assess them until you become really, really unwell. <laughs> it's very, very thorough. Um, as a process of investigation, we do a CT angiogram to delineate the anatomy of the kidney. As in this case, you can see there are single arteries on both kidneys. We prefer to remove left kidneys to the right kidney because left kidney has got longer vessels and the, the surgery becomes technically easier in, in the recipient. Uh, um, when, whenever a donor comes from the same family as the recipient, obviously it's a little bit discussed. Uh, we follow this pathway depending upon the age, depending upon the cyst visible in ultrasound, whether it's MRI or not, and if not seen, whether it's genetic testing, those are all uh, decided by Professor Ong and uh, uh, Dr. Cook. So what are the risks? Obviously, this is always a concern. What are the risks to the uh, kidney donors? This has been very thoroughly assessed. Now, if you look at the WSO data in the, sorry, in the year uh, 2020, uh, over 80,000 kidney transplants were performed in 93 member countries worldwide. Of these, about 32% were from living donor transplant. And it's considered safe universally. There had been two studies published in 2014, one from the United States and one from Norway, assessing the risk of developing anti-stage renal disease following kidney donation. Obviously, this is not a randomized controlled trial, which is not ethically possible. But when they compared the incidence of anti-stage renal disease uh, uh, after a follow-up of 15 years of these donors who have donated kidney, comparing with the donors who were assessed to donate kidney, but they didn't proceed to donation. And the incidence of uh, anti-stage renal disease was, in the American study, uh, three per thousand donors, whereas in Norway study, it was 4.7 per thousand donors. And the relative risk was said to be eight times higher in American study and 11 times higher in Norwegian study. So it is there. There is some risk of developing any renal disease, and this we always tell uh, to the, the donors when we consent. The mortality, which we normally quote uh, after kidney donation is the surgery is one in 3,000 to 6,000, which is the same as like driving on a motorway. What about gestational hypertension? There are several young female donors in their childbearing age, and we have to tell them about risk of having hypertension and preeclampsia. There's a Canadian study, and they did the same thing, compared the, the, the risk of the, the incidence of hypertension and preeclampsia in the donors who had children against a similar group of um, uh, uh, female people who were assessed as donors but didn't proceed to donation. And the risk was, the incidence was 11% versus 5%. The relative risk is about 2.2, so 2.2 times it's higher. Uh, obviously, the quality of life after donation is not bad, it's good. We did a study in Sheffield. My other daughter was involved, fortunately. <laughs> and then this was also the, the first study done in UK. And she did it as a medical student. She's now going to be a breast surgeon, obviously. Uh, the, the various domains, both in, in, in terms of physical and mental health, were uh, uh, even slightly better uh, after donation compared to before donation. And in comparison to control, they're either as good as or even better than the controls. So the quality of life is not compromised after kidney donation because they look after better actually. They are more health conscious and they take better care of themselves. And they are also followed up very regularly in, in living donor clinic. So the quality of life is definitely better. Now I deliberately put this slide only this morning at about eight o'clock I introduced this slide. For one reason, this is the first successful living donor kidney transplant which was carried out on this day, 1954, between two uh, 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 twin brothers, uh, Richard Herrick and Ronald Herrick. Uh, the, uh, uh, the operation took about eight hours or so. They stayed in the hospital about a month. And then, unfortunately, uh, uh, the kidney failed after eight years of transplantation due to recurrence of the chronic glomerular nephritis. Uh, the, the donor, Ronald Herrick, he passed away in 2010 uh, after celebrating Christmas, obviously, uh, at the age of 79. And that was 56 years after donation. 
the kidney. And he died not from kidney failure, but he died as a complication of open heart surgery on that day. So this exemplifies that uh, kidney donation is, is, is a good thing to do. It doesn't affect quality of life. And he had been a, uh, he had been a person who had been basically um, telling everyone, go for kidney donation. He used to uh, hold, organize these various meetings in different parts of America. And when I was in Mayo Clinic in 2004, I tried to meet him because he was organized. He had organized a meeting in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis. And I went there, but unfortunately, due to various strikes and various things, I got late. And I couldn't meet him and the surgeon who did this operation, uh, uh, Jose Murray. <laughs> Jose Murray passed away in 2012, unfortunately. So, so he's a very classic example to support kidney donation. Uh, the surgery that, that's involved uh, in kidney donation is called nephrectomy. These days we are doing all through keyhole technique, laparoscopic uh, technique. Uh, we introduced this in Sheffield in 2005, 17 years. It has gone very well. The advantage of laparoscopic nephrectomy is the post-operative pain is very minimal. The hospital stay is very short, usually about three days. And the return to, they can return to work much, much quicker than the traditional operation. Open surgery, the patient used to have a big cut in the loin, and the patient used to be in the hospital for 10 days, 14 days, and used to take about six months to recover. And many of them used to have a lot of pain, herniage, wound infections. So the laparoscopic surgery has definitely made a significant impact in Sheffield. Before that, we used to do about four or five living donor transplants a year, and the highest number we did, I think, three years ago was 27. So the living donation has improved significantly. And I tell you, I sent one donor home in less than 24 hours. And I regret. <laughs> because the donor in the next day when I went to war round, he was basically talking to other people, asking other people how they were. So I said, no, he's going to cause trouble now. So I sent him home. So I sent him home and then rang him several times that afternoon and night. And he was telling me, Mr. Sester, don't worry. I'm watching television. I said, you go to bed. <laughs> so then I didn't sleep very well. Uh, but it was uneventful. And then onwards, obviously, I keep the patient for at least 48 hours before sending home. And they do very well, actually. So the technique basically involves having uh, two cuts here, two little cuts to put, to introduce port. Through this port, a telescope is camera is introduced. And the other port, we introduce scalpels and knives. Those are all based on ultrasonic principles. These ultrasound uh, 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 operated knives and scissors, they cut the tissue without causing any blood loss. So we don't see any blood at all during surgery. Um, this is the kidney which has been removed, and it is flushed with preservative solution and given to the recipient surgeon, who then implants the kidney on the other side. What is in disease donor and nephrectomy, obviously, uh, we make a, a long cut is made through the whole abdomen, and tube is introduced through the aorta to flush the kidney and the blood is vented through the other port. And once the kidney is harvested, packed on the ice box and transported to the center where the recipient is waiting. Um, what happens in this process of DC donor transplantation, suppose if I'm on call surgeon, middle of the night, I get a call saying, there's a kidney offer for you. The kidney is available for one of your recipients in your center. Uh, and been matched, tissue type, blood groups have been matched, are you happy to accept the kidney? So we go through all the details of the recipient, and if it's suitable, we think it's safe to uh, transplant, then we admit the recipient in the ward. Accept the kidney and bring the recipient to the ward and start reassessing, because the, kidney, the recipient had been on the waiting list for several months or years, and we don't know how the situation was, so physicians as well as surgeons, we assess them. Um, and in the meantime, the blood from the recipient as well as the donor are sent to the tissue typing lab and cross match is done. That means it's the testing compatibility between the donor and recipient uh, tissue types. Um, there is a cross match system called virtual cross match, which is done on paper. For example, if we know in advance the tissue type of the recipient and we get information about the tissue type of the donor, then we match them together. And if there had not been any history of sensitizers in the past in the recipient from blood transfusion or pregnancy or transplantation, then we accept it. Rather, and that 
basically cuts down the cross match time, which takes normally four to six hours, sometimes even longer. So the cold ischemia time is reduced. So virtual cross match is in practice in Sheffield. So that saves time. And uh, donor tissue means lymph nodes and spleen comes along with the kidney. And uh, we isolate T cells and B cells from the, those tissues and match with the uh, recipient's blood to make sure that the organ is compatible and not going to get rejected. Uh, so I have discussed that. The, when the patient, uh, once the kidney arrives in the department, surgeons have to look at it, make sure that the anatomy is correct. So it's a bacterial preparation. What we do, we basically uh, clean the whole kidney. We saw it, most of the time it's covered with fat, and sometimes we don't even know if there's any tumor or anything uh, that's been covered by the fat. And we have to clean the kidney, and if there's any suspicious lesion, we send it for further inspection straight away. There are kidneys with multiple arteries sometimes, like this kidney had four arteries, managed to transplant it, it worked successfully. There could be sometimes arteries cut like that, so we have to reconstruct an implant in that way. And there, there, there are different technical ways, basically, to reconstruct the arteries and use them successfully, and we didn't have any problem. So the transplant the surgery involves having a cut here in the groin. We cut the, make a small incision, go inside, create a space, and find out those blood vessels that means the iliac vein and iliac artery will supply blood to the leg. And that's where the renal artery is anastomosed to the iliac, external iliac artery and vein to the iliac vein, and the ureter is anastomosed to the bladder. And there's a little plastic tube that lies in the ureter that's called a stent, uh, and now it has become a routine. And that stent is to prevent, protect this anastomosis, this joining over here so that urine doesn't leak. And this stent is removed after, usually after about six weeks through urethra under local anesthetic with the help of a telescope. And uh, there you can see uh, the kidney has been, this, that's the ureter actually I'm holding, but the kidney is very well perfused, nice and pink after completing the, this anastomosis. And many times we do see urine straight away on the table. So post-operatively patient goes to the general ward most of the time, very occasionally go to high dependency unit if there are some risk factors. We maintain oxygenation, monitor all those, and then our urine output, we weigh the patient every day and make sure patient is not overloaded. And then the important thing patient gets is the immunosuppressive drugs, the anti-rejection drugs, which are started before the patient goes to theater, and then is given every day. There are catheters that stays for five days. There are a couple of drains draining the wound, that stays for a couple of days. Normally stays about five to seven days. While in the ward, we do imaging, and that is a routine. An ultrasound scan of the kidney is a routine, that's done as a baseline, where we see the blood flowing into the kidney. If there's any bleeding or any fluid around the kidney, that is detected. Occasionally, we have to do CT angiogram if, there's the, if, this, if the duplex scan, if the ultrasound scan is not uh, is, um, informative, if there's any doubt. We send for an angiogram that basically shows the renal artery, patent renal artery, and a well perfused kidney, and there is also well perfused kidney there. It's important that the patient should take all these anti rejection drugs very regularly. They should not be missed even a single dose. If we over immunosuppress the patient, that means if we give too much of the drug, then patients are likely to get infections. And if right amount of drug is not taken, then the immune system attacks the kidney and the kidney gets rejected. You see this, this, this is biopsy, the histology of the kidney, which is a lot of inflammation there, a lot of lymphocytes are attacking the kidney. And in worst case scenario, kidney can become like that and then work, it gets rejected. So there are, these are the drugs, basiliximab, antithymocytoglobulin, elemtuzumab. These drugs are given in the first couple of days as an induction uh, a drug. And the maintenance drugs are tractolimus, MMF, azathioprine, prednisolone, sterolimus. Of these, usually two, three are being taken, like tractolimus, MMF, and prednisolone. These are the most commonly used interjection drugs. There are other complications we normally tell the patients at the time of consenting. They're like bleeding, infections. Infections could be bacterial, viral, fungal, delayed graft function, as you discussed before, technical complications, the urine leak, Sometimes blood can clot in the kidney, or fluid can, sorry, the spelling mistake, a fluid can collect around the kidney. And there are side effects of the drug, such as tacrolimus can cause slight tremor of the hand. There can be loss of hair. Um, sometimes one can become diabetic. Um, 
steroids cause uh, bruising, puffiness on the face, the brittle bones, bones can become osteoporotic. Microfenolate, for example, causes gastrointestinal disturbance when you can have diarrhea. So, but those drugs are titrated very carefully so that we strike a right balance and don't give you too much or too little. And if, you, if the tolerance is not there, then we can swap the drugs to other uh, agent. The donors are very thorough, uh, rejection, sorry. The, despite being on anti-rejection drugs, uh, there can still be rejection, and that happens in 15 out of 100 patients. And so the rejection is diagnosed by deterioration of kidney function. So the urine output may become less, the creatinine will start rising, and um, then we get a bit worried. What we do, we do a biopsy, take a little bit of tissue out of the kidney and look under the microscope. If there is evidence of rejection, we treat with more powerful drugs. The majority of these rejections are reversible, they can be treated, but maybe say 10% of the rejections may not respond to any kind of treatment and may progress to final loss of kidney. And the rejections are two types. We call acute rejection, which could be cell-mediated or antibody-mediated. The cell-mediated rejections are slightly easier to treat with methylprednisolone, but the antibody-mediated rejection, which happens in people getting mismatched kidney, or have had previous transplants or pregnancy-related or blood transfusion-related antibodies, they can attack the kidney and can lead to deterioration of function. That can also be treated by plasma phoresis, um, IVIG. There are ways around it, but the treatment is more intense. Cancers. Cancers can be either transmitted cancer or can be de novo cancer. The skin cancers and lymphomas, the, the post-transplant lymphoparesis, these are, these are the two common types of cancer we do see in transplant patients. But the incidence is not high. There's only a small number of patients to get it. Uh, the TRAS is uh, transplant in large stenosis. What about mortality after having transplant surgery? Is there any mortality associated with the surgery? It's a major surgery, and we have to consent for it. The NHSBT, the NHSBT um, um, website does say the mortality that we should be quoting to the patient is one to two per 100 patients. That is directly related to surgery. That means within the first 30 days of surgery, that mortality can happen, but we don't see that. I mean, I've been doing transplant for nearly 30 years. I think I have seen one that happened because the patient had pre-existing pre heart disease and that had been underestimated probably. So it's not that common. Obviously, after one year, um, yeah, about 5% of the patients do die from various other reasons, not from directly, from, uh, directly related to surgery. Uh, so if you look at this outcome, this tells you. So the kidney survival, the transplant survival after living donor transplant at the end of one year is 95%, after deceased donor transplant is 90%. At five years, it's 90%, 80%, and in 15 years, the difference is 10%. What about patient survival? After living donor transplant, 99% of the patients are alive at one year, whereas DC donor is slightly less. After 10 years, again, the difference is about 10%. And how does that This one? Yeah. 70 to 76%. Mm, okay. So, yeah, it's 10 years. And if you ask me how much, how, how, what sort of lifespan you expect from a living donor transplant, they say the living donor kidney survives about 20 to 25 years, where the deceased donor about 15 to 20 years, that's what. But it's again, depends from person to person. There, there are various factors that influence the long-term outcomes in every individual. It's difficult to predict for a particular person how long this kidney is going to last for that particular Survival is that much in one year. Something is missing now. <laughs> Did I speak too loud? <laughs> okay, it's working now. Okay, so, so one has to remember that living, living kidney donation is safe, as I have shown several examples, and it provides the best outcome. So it's very important to approach family members or friends well in advance for kidney donation if we think that the kidney function is going to deteriorate and one needs transplant rather than being on dialysis first. I would like to touch a little bit about coronavirus and kidney transplantation. I think it's very important, it's very topical because I myself is recovering from that. <laughs> I'm eight weeks, but I'm perfectly well. So um, the, the COVID actually, the coronavirus actually, affects every single organ in the body. 
that's the first message I'm giving to this slide, because wherever there is AC angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor present, the coronavirus spike protein sticks to that. Now, the blood vessels, the lining of the blood vessels do have that receptor. Oh, it's timing-wise, I think I'm getting late, is it? Okay. That's it. I'll take, I'll take five minutes. No, I'm okay. Five minutes, okay. Sure. So, so whatever this blood vessel in the body, the coronavirus can get attached, and that sets up very severe inflammatory reaction. The blood vessels, the blood can clot and ultimately lead to the organ injury. So if it's in lungs, for example, if the lung doesn't work properly, there will be lack of oxygen globally. So global hypoxia, that will affect the organs. The inflammatory changes due to release of various cytokines can affect distant organs. And also direct damage caused by the coronavirus to the tubules and glomerular of the kidney. So these are the three mechanisms which lead to organ damage in coronavirus disease. Um, because after transplantation, the recipients are on immunosuppressive drugs, the immune system is suppressed, the COVID can become very, very severe. And particularly in the presence of pre-existing comorbidities, the disease can be very, very severe. And when a recipient gets COVID infection, we have to reduce the immunosuppression to let the immune system build up a little bit to fight with the coronavirus. In that situation, there's risk of rejection of the organ. So it's a very difficult situation. However, life takes priority over kidney, so we have to Think about that. Um, compared to normal population, obviously, uh, the transplant patients have higher mortality. And this was basically uh, from one of these French uh, COVID registry, 17.9% 11.4%. How do we consent the patient in relation uh, regarding uh, mortality uh, once they have kidney transplant? Now, we haven't got any data since the vaccination started. But before vaccination was available, vaccine was available, we used to say that after transplant, if the patient gets admitted in ITU, the mortality could be as high as 50%. And that's for emergency surgery. And all decisions on a transplant are emergency surgery. Whereas for elective surgery, it used to be 15% for male and 7.5% for female. This, I think these figures have changed now. It must be quite less. Um, I, I don't think I will go through this in great detail. But however, I would say that in the NHSVD website, this paper is available now. And that basically shows the impact of vaccination on the incidence of coronavirus infection and death. So of the 43,000 solid organ transplant recipient at 31st of August, 90% uh, uh, had received two doses of vaccine, 2.6% had one dose, and 7.1% didn't have any vaccination. And at that time, uh, say of these 43,000, there were 30,000, nearly 31,000 were kidney transplant recipients, 71%. And half of them had received estrogenic vaccine and half had received Pfizer vaccine. Now, if you look at the positive case, cases and the death, unvaccinated group out of 2,146, about 92% had positive detection of uh, coronavirus COVID. The death was 10%. But those who had one dose, the infection rate was nearly 25%. But those are two doses, infection rate only 3.4%. So definitely, the, the, the infection rate was low. However, the mortality wasn't different. The limitation of the study is the registry data analyzed retrospectively. So there was no information on the severity of the symptoms, the hospitalization days, transplant rejection and graft loss, and long COVID data. So those are missing. However, it gives a very important information that the infection rate is definitely high when one is not vaccinated. So, with regard to survival of all the solid organ transplant recipients, uh, there is significant difference between the unvaccinated and two-dose vaccinated group of patients. There's about 20% reduction in their mortality if we adjust for age, the various comorbidities. It's very important. And age has got significant impact on that. So if you look at here, over the age of, under the age of 50, the mortality was somewhere here, 2.1% versus 12%. So this is important. So the message, clear message, the BTS and the NHSBT gives is everyone should have vaccine and booster doses. If possible, get vaccinated before transplant and then take all the precautions to avoid contracting COVID. That means masks, hand washing, sanitation, et cetera. And if someone has got COVID in the family, report early 
get treated early. And if, if the patient, if the transplant patient gets COVID, it must be immediately, the unit must be contacted immediately and appropriate treatment in the form of steroids, antiviral drugs, or neutralizing antibodies, all those should be given. And in this website, it gives very clear message about the transplant unit should adopt certain policies with regard to transplantation, how to consent the recipient, what different precautions take. Like we have got COVID-free ward now, and we test for the PCR as soon as the patient arrives, and then monitor very regularly. And same with the staffs, I do my uh, uh, lateral flow test twice weekly. That's not very reliable, but I do it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so it's very important to realize that it's a gift of life. It's a very important organ, so we've got to look after it. We've got to take the medicine very regularly in time without missing a single dose. And all the risk factors that can lead to uh, loss of uh, transplants, such as uh, um, smoking, not drinking, I would say, um, <laughs> Uh, diet, exercise, all those are very important. Control of diabetes, hypertension, all those have to be done. Have we got five minutes more? Or it's too late? Five, five minutes? Oh, quick, okay. So with regards to dialysis, peritoneal dialysis and, and hemodialysis are the two modes of dialysis available. And PD is possible in the presence of polycystic kidney disease. Many people think it's, it's, it may not be feasible, but it is feasible. Um, in, with regards to PD, obviously a catheter introduced. I do laparoscopically these days, which has got a very high success rate. Uh, hemodialysis needs formation of arteriovenous fistula or put a graft if the fistula is impossible. And in the beginning, tunnel neckline is used for dialysis purpose. Patient has to go to hospital three times a week. This can also be done at home. And one important thing I would like to tell you here is the incidence of COVID is certainly less in PD patient compared to hospital hemodialysis. Same with the home hemodialysis. If it was a reduction in the rate of COVID infection, diagnosis, hospitalization, all are less when you do either home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis compared to hospital dialysis in this COVID environment. And there are several advantages of PD in comparison to hemodialysis, including the cognitive function is better with PD. That has been a very nice study published from Germany. Management of policy kidneys obviously is a multidisciplinary management, and the complications management need, require surgery sometimes, particularly if there's bleeding from the cyst or due to stone, then nephrectomy may be needed, but the majority of time is managed conservatively. Rest, analgesics, sometimes tranexamic acid. <coughs> if the cyst sometimes is quite large, causing problem and the patient is unsuitable for surgery, there are reports of transcatheter embolization. That means through the groin, you put a catheter and then inject stainless steel coils or some kind of coils to occlude the blood vessels. Like in this case, the size of the kidney is reduced to that size from that size after embolization. And that's being done in the United States sometimes. The nephrectomy is needed to improve quality of life and if there are complications or to create space for a transplant. Sorry, I, I will take this, skip this slide off. So the complications of nephrectomy is there bleeding? Sometimes there can be very low blood pressure if you remove the both adrenal glands, or if the blood vessel, blood supply to the adrenal gland is disturbed, then one can have low blood pressure and may require lifelong replacement of the adrenal hormones. Ileus, paralyzed bowel after surgery, incisional hernias can happen after this operation because of the some uh, some malady of the uh, the collagen tissue formation. If we remove both kidneys at a time, there are disadvantages. For example, one stops producing urine, then the fluid intake has to be compromised. Uh, there is controversy about timing, approach, and whether to perform both kidney removal or single kidney removal. There is no professional consensus. With regard to timing of the nephrectomy, if you do removal of the kidney before doing a transplant, there are higher complication rates compared to removal after transplant, the hospital stay, the blood transfusion rate, and the hemoglobin. These are all significantly worse if the kidney is removed before transplant. I'll skip that slide. Now, in America, people are doing simultaneous removal of the both kidneys and transplant, which is a bit too much for us. I don't think I can do it. <laughs> but they have done it. It's particularly the Mayo Clinic where I went for a little bit of training, they do a lot of it. For example, out of nearly 2,500 patients who had bilateral nephrectomy, 271 patients had bilateral nephrectomy and renal transplant. 
But the intraoperative bleeding was three times more, blood transfusion rate was high, more complications, and hospitalization slightly high. But there was no difference in the outcome of the, 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 the transplant. So basically, they're trying to save hospitalization the cost. In, our, in Sheffield, what we do, we remove the symptomatic kidney, the complicated kidney, either before or after transplantation, depending upon the symptoms. And I've tried laparoscopic nephrectomy in one patient, polycystic kidney, that was done successfully, but I will not try again, it's quite hard. <laughs> it's open, it's easier. Um, this, what happens to the size of the kidney after kidney transplant, the polycystic kidney? So there's a very nice study published from Japan. It says the polycystic kidney size is reduced by 37.7% at one year, nearly 40% at three years, but the liver size is increases post-kidney transplant. This is very important information. Uh, I went to Mayo Clinic and they emphasized this fact to me. They, they embedded in my brain. So I try not to do an effect to me before transplant unless it's absolutely necessary. Okay, so liver disease, uh, this is present in 70 to 80%. They can present with the size-related problem or infection. And there's one patient I would like to tell you. This patient has had polycystic kidney as well as liver. And this to get recurrent cholangitis. Her kidney failed and was on dialysis. So, so in Leeds, the patient has simultaneous liver transplant as well as kidney transplant. Now the kidney is getting infection, so it's going to have bilateral nephrectomy very soon. There can be colonic diverticulosis, as we discussed before, and they can present with infection. And patients also may need parathyroidectomy. That's what the surgeons are called for. I don't do normally parathyroid myself, but my other colleagues do it. So the parathyroid glands basically maintain the calcium level in the blood through various loops. And in kidney failure, the parathyroid glands become hyperactive. And so that leads to mobilization of the calcium from the bones, and bones become painful, or sometimes fracture can occur. In those situations, initially tried with sinocalcid. If that doesn't work, then parathyroid can be done. That's the last slide. So the key message is, obviously, preservation of renal function through medical treatment, including 12 10 is very important. And management of PKD is a needs multidisciplinary approach. Those patients whose kidney function is deteriorated should go for preemptive transplant. If possible, living donor transplant, that's the best option. And those who, don't, who, those who are not suitable for transplant, peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis, both are possible. And nephrectomy is indicated in special circumstances. And in the PKD charity website, there are two uh, basically information pages, which deals with kidney transplant as well as surgical management of the disease. Thank you very much for attention.